Sammy oh, adopted it as your grandson, which makes it my great grandson. That's true. <laughs> Do you get to see them often? Yeah, they come over. That's, that's so cool. Leave that question to the end, I would ask. You know, if I lived in Boston, I'd be here finished. every day. Bugging <laughs> no. uh, you. Yeah. Uh, uh, you so can you stop and be, start again. Uh, uh, I you are the most celebrated and uh, most referenced modern scholar. And also, also you are very humble. Also the most vilified. <laughs> vilified. <laughs> and I saw your name in uh, David Horowitz's professor's F is highlighted. Am I up there? Yes, <laughs> you're up there. You got F from him. That's a good one. And uh, you are a global activist. You are very humble. And uh, I consider you a guy with great brain, mind, and great heart. That's really, we see someone in your prominence that goes and uh, supports the people who are vilified, not supported. And uh, now my question, the first question, I will have hopefully six questions. And if yeah. you have more time, hopefully seventh question will be a little bit off the topic. Um, what, uh, I don't see you in much in mass media. When I came here 22 years ago, I was like Pollyanna. I'm still grateful being in this country to have freedom that is uh, true constitution uh, guaranteed, though I think it's slipping away in certain way gradually. Now, the, in mass media, we don't see you. And when I ask my students in philosophy class, how many of them heard you few hands up, but uh, in the world you are more recognized by general population. One thing comes to my mind, whether there's conspiracy, what do you think? It's not conspiracy, but it's certainly true, not just me, yeah. incidentally, any dism. But, uh, for example, I do have uh, regular columns that are distributed by the New York Times syndicate which reaches every newspaper in the country and most of those in the world. I don't think one has ever been picked up in the United States. They're probably about 70 or 80 by now. They're published elsewhere. Actually, not even much in Europe. They're published, except Southern Europe. They're published in the South, usually, what's called the South. Uh, the, the countries which, in fact, are more free in many ways. I mean, they have more, less free political systems. But it's often the case that they're intellectually and culturally more open. And I don't think that's an accident. The, uh, in fact, if you look at the history of propaganda and indoctrination, it's really quite interesting. Uh, the, the huge propaganda industries, uh, the biggest one ever is the U.S. public relations industry. In fact, it used to call itself propaganda. Uh, now that's not a nice word, so they don't use it anymore. But the early, uh, the earliest uh, uh, manuals in the PR industry were simply called propaganda, and uh, its main uh, it developed uh, the, these industries, which are enormous, uh, developed in the free countries, in Britain and the United States, and for a good reason, about a century ago, and for quite a good reason, which was conscious, it was recognized that people had won enough rights through popular struggle that it was getting harder to control them by force. And if it's hard to control people by force, you have to find some other way. And uh, the other way is control of attitudes and opinions. Uh, in fact, uh, and it was very conscious. I've written about it, you know, it's described. The people are, quote, the people are stupid and ignorant, and for their own good, we have to make sure that we, the responsible men, are called whoever we are. Uh, uh, we run things, and they can be spectators, but not participants. And we have to keep them out of our hair. We have to, one of the great, greatest public intellectual in the United States in the 20th century, Walter Lippmann, the progress, these are mostly progressives, incidentally, the Wilson, Roosevelt, the, you know, Kennedy, the yeah. world. Uh, his view was we have to protect ourselves from the trampling and the roar of the bewildered herd, uh, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, the general public, always for their own good, of course. Exactly. They're just too stupid and ignorant. To As you it. put it, manufacturing consent. Well, that's, exactly. that's his phrase. I borrowed it from him. And the others in the propaganda industry was called engineering of consent. But 
the same idea. And so it makes quite good sense. And it's, uh, there's no conspiracy, it's just internalized. Nature. It's internalized by the intellectual classes. Sometimes it's taught, literally. So for example, there's a concept of objectivity that's used in the media, and it's taught in journalism schools, and it's, uh, it's discussed by editors and so on. Objectivity means reporting accurately what's said within the beltway okay. in, in the Washington circles. So if you have something discussed within the beltway, no matter how crazy it is, no matter what's left out and so on, you report it accurately. And the results are sometimes astonishing. Uh, okay, let me give you one example right now, which is really quite urgent. I mean, within the beltway, the line is the greatest threat to peace in the world is Iran. If you looked at the presidential debate, and the commentary on it, and, you know, just the, anything, greatest threat in the world is Iran. Well, that raises a couple of questions, if you're sensible. Now, first of all, who thinks it's a threat? Uh, secondly, uh, what is the threat? Thirdly, what can you do about it, whatever it is? Well, the answers are pretty straightforward. Uh, who thinks it's a threat? The United States and its allies. But the rest of the world doesn't regard it as much of a threat. But the non-aligned movements, most of the world, you know, yeah. strongly supports Iran's right to enrich uranium, denounces the sanctions, and so on. Now, the Arab world is interesting. The propaganda line here is that the Arabs support the United States. And that's not totally false. The dictators do. Exactly. Not the people. The population strongly opposes it. Exactly. But hatred of democracy is so profound and deep-seated that if the population overwhelmingly opposes us and the dictators support us, they support us. Exactly. And that's like 100%. In fact, the, the studies of public opinion, which are taken by the leading U.S. polling agencies, they don't get reported because of yep. what they show. But, so that's who. Uh, what about uh, what the threat is? Well, you, know, you, you can learn that from the Pentagon and uh, U.S. intelligence. The basic threat, they say, is deterrence. They might get in our way if we want to use force and violence. Uh, the other threat is what they call destabilization. Like they're trying to expand their influence into neighboring countries, and we're supposed to run them. No. Uh, so that's the threat. Uh, what can you do about it? That's the most interesting part. It's a very simple way of addressing it. Whatever you think the problem is, big or large, a very straightforward way of addressing it. Uh, move to establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region. Uh, the overwhelming international support for that. The Arab world, the, the non-aligned countries. The, I mean, support is so overwhelming that even the United States has to formally agree, but with a qualification. Uh, Obama repeated it recently. The qualification is a great idea, but not now, and it has to exclude Israel. Yeah. Okay. End of discussion. <laughs> uh, there's a conference coming up in a couple of months in Helsinki to an international conference to move forward on this. That's ex you know, if you think there's a threat, that's the way to address it. Very simply, no sanctions, no bombing, no consequence. Uh, there can't be any, uh, it won't get anywhere as long as the U.S. vetoes it, uh, unless there's popular pressure here, the U.S. is not going to change its policy. The American public but is very... One yeah. more sentence. There can't be pressure here unless anybody knows about it. Exactly. Now, here's where the media come in. There has been a hundred percent conformity, literally, in not reporting it. Now, you couldn't achieve that in a totalitarian state. It's done without conspiracy, without pressure, just by internal subordination to power which is internalized. And I think that's the crucial part. That's the, actually one of the founders of uh, modern political science, uh, realist political science, tough-minded political science, Hans Morgenthau. He once described uh, the pathology of American intellectuals as what he called their conformist subservience to those in power. And that's almost uniform. And it's not it's not kind of chosen, it's just part of you. You don't even get to be a person called 
uh, an act of respected intellectual with very rare exceptions, unless you internalize this. And it shows up in the media. Yeah, it is cognitive dissonance. It is, I don't even think there's any dissonance. You're not, you're not even dissonant. There's no dissonance. Because wow. uh, people don't recognize it as problematic. I mean, when there, actually, an interesting, you know, the journal F uh, Extra by FAIR, there's a group called Fairness and Accuracy, is reporting yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, of course. But there, I think maybe their last issue had a short article in which they, uh, they discuss a, a colloquy with uh, the managing editor of the New York Times or some high New York Times official was asked about why, the, how they're reporting the political campaign. They're just reporting every lie as a statement of fact and so on and so forth and leaving out all sorts of other things. And he said just what I said before. He said, that's what it means to be objective. And then they asked uh, one of their top reporters. He agreed. He said, yes, we're doing our job. We're reporting what they say in Washington accurately. Now, they're not saying anything. Well, they didn't raise this. But if it was asked, they say, well, they're not saying anything about the Helsinki conference. So why should we report it? Uh, just because it's the most important thing to report. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so there's no cognitive dissonance. Okay. They're doing exactly what sounds right and what they're taught and what's internalized. And it's a well, uh, I also meant like Christians in this country, and especially the wrong wing Christians, wrong wing, I call them, and they are co opted too. And I think in that part, when the, I see. Uh, the, uh, Co-opted, yeah. Christians, uh, the Christian. wrong wing, I call them, right, the right wing Christians, and they go to church. They say peace, love your neighbor, and they say the golden rule. But when they come out, they vote for the bigger military, more military, more invasion, more wars. But but there is cognitive so dissonance there. So, no, I don't think so. I mean, they're doing it for the most noble reason. Uh, we have to, uh, uh, in fact, look, the whole history of the church is like this. You just take a look at the history of the church, what's now called the Catholic Church. It used to be just the Christian Church. Uh, for the first three centuries after Christ, uh, Christians were persecuted, harshly persecuted. And there's a good reason for that. If you read the Gospels, it's radical pacifist. Yeah. And that's, the Romans aren't going to allow that. So they were viciously persecuted until the year 315, when the Emperor Constantine adopted Christianity as the official religion of the, Holy, of the Roman Empire. And then the, the cross, which had been the symbol of suffering and persecuted people, that was put on the shield of the Roman, Roman legions. Just the opposite. Uh, wow. One of the great historians of Christianity, Hans Kuhn, says at that point, the Church of the Persecuted became the Church of the Persecutors. And it remained that way until 1962. 1962, with Vatican II, Pope John XXIII, uh, tried to get the Church to go back to the Gospels. And it had an effect, especially in Latin America, where uh, the bishops and uh, the nuns and priests, uh, you know, lay people went out to, to try to organize peasants, to organize them in communities where they would read the Gospels, which is extremely subversive. Yeah. I mean, read doesn't mean just say the words, you know. It means think about what the words mean and organize to try to defend themselves uh, from the horrors in which they live. The U.S. reaction was quite interesting. The U.S. immediately went to war against the church. And if you look from 62 to 89, there was a bitter war, war against the church. Lots of religious martyrs, the archbishop, Jesuit uh, intellectuals, uh, slaughtered. Uh, and the U.S. Army is quite open about it. If you go to the School of the Americas, where they train Latin American officers, uh, one of their talking points, advertising points, is that the U.S. Army helped defeat liberation theology. The liberation theology was the attempt to revive the gospel. We're not having any of that stuff. Uh, so that's the history of the church. And it's, uh, it's not as, you know, there always were some critics around the fringes, like every Republican, you know, Stalinist Russia, you know, any Iran, wherever you pick. But uh, 
But these are the general tendencies. And the same with uh, Muhammad and Jesus. They were not capitalists, just they, no. the other way around. They were for the poor, for the weak. Oh, that's why. Right. And then, but... That's why Jesus was crucified. Exactly. Um, well, I hope that we can cover all these things. Uh, the, the crew did not show up, therefore I have oh. my former student, I found her here. And therefore we don't have microphone. I hope that it's captioned. This is a top of the line camera, camcorder. <laughs> Are you picking up the sound? I have no idea. Uh, yeah. If she heard, I hopefully think, uh, yeah, yeah, hopefully. Now, I want to go, it is related. Uh, uh, the second question is about so-called democracy. When I go to the Walmart, I see about half a dozen bathroom tissues. Go to the Baskin Robbins, I don't know, ice cream. Do, do you know about ice cream company? Yeah. About 30 some plus. I have children. Okay, <laughs> 30 plus flavor of ice cream now. And, but in this country, we have more than 300 million people with diverse backgrounds, with diverse ethnic, religious, and cultural background. We have only two parties, and this really baffles me. And uh, it is somehow the system is designed in a way that punishes those people who would like to vote for a third party. What do you think about that? First of all, I think it's more accurate to say we have only one party. We have what's called the business party yeah. that has two factions. They're called Democrats and Republicans, and they're somewhat different, but not entirely. But if you want to take a look at the two, if, what, the two party system, which I mean, goes way back, but its current form developed since the Civil War. Uh, take a look at the newspapers uh, last, when, the day after the election, mm -hmm. and they all had maps, a red map, red and blue. Just take a look at the red and the blue. It's the Civil War. Yeah. Now, the Confederacy is red. The exactly. North is blue. Now, they've actually changed the names. Uh, that happened in the 60s. Uh, up until the 1960s, the Confederacy was Democrat, and the North was Republican. Uh, during the 60s, civil rights legislation was passed, and some limited rights were given to African Americans, which caused a great fury and anger among the uh, dominant, you know, the ruling majority, the white majority. And Richard Nixon was a good politician, whatever you think about him. And he initiated what he called his Southern strategy, that is to take over the racist South and call them Republican. And that worked very well. There were other things that contributed to it. We don't have time, but there were a lot of interesting things. Actually, Northern liberals contributed to it in many ways. But anyway, it happened. So the names have shifted. But the phenomena are the same. And in fact, if you look at American politics after the Civil War, the politics, the two parties, there had been parties, but the parties that emerged became sectional parties. Now, there was actually a slogan. Mm -hmm. You vote or you shoot. And so if you shot for the Confederates, you voted Democratic. And conversely, there was some mixture because the Northern Catholic workers tended to be Democrat, mm -hmm. but they were kind of stuck in Tammany-style uh, systems, you know, Irish politicians and so on and so forth. So it was kind of a little mixed, but that's basically what it was. And it pretty much stays like that with the name changes. Uh, one effect is that both parties very quickly were taken over by uh, manufacturing and financial elites. So they both became right-wing business parties, uh, not class-based parties. Uh, and uh, then you know, the U.S. doesn't have a parliamentary system, so there's a big barrier to start with against uh, getting other voices in. But the basic structure of the system, it's, it was a highly business-run society, and much more so than Europe. There are all kinds of reasons, but it's true. That it's mm -hmm. the one reason why the history of the labor movement in the United States is so violent, much more so than Europe. And uh, the, the welfare measures are limited by European standards and so on. So a lot of, a lot of uh, consequences and interesting sources. But, uh, the effect on the party system is you get a one-party, uh, two-faction system. Yep, it's and proven. In fact, if you look close, there's very good, there's very interesting work in the political science.
science literature, the academic literature on this. They take the most recent kind of gold standard, the best mm -hmm. work on it. Uh, what they can, what concludes is from study of polling, which is extensive, so we know a lot about attitudes and uh, policy, which of course you know. It turns out that the, if you look at the income level, you know, zero, lowest to the top, the bottom 70 percent has no influence on policy. Uh, political leaders just don't pay any attention to them. Yeah. So they're essentially disenfranchised. Uh, as you move up the level, you get more influence. When you get to the top, you get what you want. You know? And if you look at the outcome of the last election, this election, uh, the most striking fact is the correlation of income level to voting. It's almost a straight line. Uh, if you go from, from the poorest to the richest, it gets more and more Republican. In fact, if you go above it with a approximately the median income, roughly $50,000. Above that, uh, Romney would have had a landslide. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that kind of understates the fact, because almost half the population doesn't vote, and overwhelmingly they're poor, and overwhelmingly they're democratic. Yeah. And probably the reason they don't vote is that intuitively, without studying political science texts, they no, it doesn't it change. It doesn't make any difference what they say because nobody's going to pay any attention to it, so why bother? Yeah, this is a land of contradiction to me. It's kind of like Janus with two faces. For example, freedom, why I enjoy here, though the loudspeakers in the hand of the few, and uh, but we have the highest prison population in the world. We preach the world about freedom. But that's recent, remember. Yeah. That's it, that's it's Reagan. Yeah. And it has to do with the... War on crime, so-called drugs. Well, but it has to do with the neoliberal policies. Yeah. Um, all across the world, there's been a neoliberal assault against the populations. Uh, it's different effects in different places, you know. It's different in Egypt than in the United States, but it's all over. Uh, all kind of reasons for it. In the United States, one effect was uh, to sharply change the income distribution. So you have enormous, there's been wealth created, but it's going into very few pockets. So you have extreme uh, concentration of wealth, which affects the political system immediately. And also there's been a decision that didn't have to be done to offshore manufacturing, uh, which is fine for financial institutions, it's grown enormously and is very honorable to working people. You have a superfluous population. What do you want to do with them? One thing you do with them is throw them in jail. And uh, yeah, freedom, yeah, I just I want to list few contradictions. The opportunity is celebrated, we have opportunity, but recently... The you know, yeah. US has lower social mobility than Europe. Exactly, it's just the opposite. And also recently, Gini Index, I look at it, United States is among the worst countries, top five, Chile, Mexico, and the United States, Turkey, my home country, and Israel. Which is the, one, the fourth one? The fourth one, Turkey, 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 and Israel. The worst countries, I, I call them the more, the worst immoral countries. Well, but there's reasons for take yeah. Chile. Yeah. That's since Pinochet. You know, yeah. And they've never pulled out of it. It's a U.S. backed dictatorship, which yeah. did it. It was an early stage of the neoliberal assault and a very brutal one. Israel, it's recent. It's like the U.S. since the 80s. Uh, it used to be a kind of social democratic country, but since it became partly because of the occupation, partly because of the reliance on the U.S. came to mimic the U.S., uh, uh, Mexico, of course, is very much under U.S. influence. And Turkey has its own... Got the influence yeah. recently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this, but I mean, these things don't happen by accident. And. Um, I want to go to, uh, of course, human rights. Uh, I see, my gosh, I was incredible, totally sh shocked when I see these scholars and these talking heads with ties, with well-grooming, they are trying to justify torture. Unbelievable, it's shock for me. And, uh, of course, we know the list of the wars. Uh, I think it's worse than you think. Yeah. I mean, take, say, Bush's torture. Actually, I wrote about it. I think he was unfairly criticized because the torture that was carried out, 
The U.S. never signed the torture convention. Really? But, I, uh, uh, technically, it signed it, but if you look closely, did the rat ratification? It only it ratified yeah. it and signed it, but only after it was rewritten. Okay. The Senate rewrote it, and they rewrote it to exclude a certain category of torture, uh, what's called mental torture, meaning the kind of torture that doesn't leave marks, uh, and that's the kind of torture that is in the CIA manuals. Now they picked it up from the KGB. The KGB discovered years ago that the most effective way to turn a person into a vegetable is what's called mental torture. You know, isolation, uh, uh, threats, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's much better than electrodes in the general. You know. And the CIA picked that up and that's what's in the CIA manuals. And that's what the U.S. signed. And that's pretty much what the CIA did in Guantanamo. You read the. Uh, I saw this book, Guantanamo by David Hicks. David Hicks is an Australian. Yeah. Who. Uh, is he a journalist, the guy no, who makes documents? He okay. happened to be in Afghanistan. Oh. And the, uh, the Northern, when the Northern Alliance came down, they picked him up and they sold him as a bounty to the Americans. And uh, he was treated viciously. Uh, uh, first in Afghanistan, then in Guantanamo, it's a horror story. They never had any anything. Of it. They just kind of concocted a story that he's a major Al Qaeda operative. Uh, he's Australian, so finally they managed to get him out to Australia, where he was freed under some limitations, and he knew about it. So he's able to write about it, and most of the people aren't. Uh, but if you take a look at the torture, it's uh, within the framework of accepted U.S. torture. Uh, actually, the, the main historian of torture, a very good scholar, Al, Alfred McCoy of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. uh, he's written about this. He points out that this is normal U.S. torture. Uh, and a lot of the criticisms of Bush are really quite unfair. Now, it's true that uh, you and Bybee and these guys kind of went off the deep mm -hmm. end, but the main criticisms are well within the framework of standard U.S. torture. In fact, if you go to a maximum security prison in the United States, mm -hmm. it's probably worse than Guantanamo. I lived in Turkish prison for four years. Mm -hmm. I know how cruel it is. Mm -hmm. And also I suffered torture about one year, and both mental and physical. And therefore I have, I, I consider these guys worse than animals, the worst animals. I just, I have personal, also, <laughs> experience of what this guy is trying to yeah. justify. Uh, Noam, I want to, uh, the third question, I don't want to tire you more. I just, with regard Go to ahead, Turkey, please. just one. Yeah. I mean, I've been very yeah. interested in Turkey for a lot of reasons. One reason is because uh, the worst crimes in Turkey in recent years are overwhelmingly backed by the United States. Yeah. Like the worst crimes yeah. were in the 90s. When you know, better than I do, but it's a real horror story. About 80 percent of the arms were coming from the U.S. As uh, torture and terror and violence went up, U.S. arms went up. In 1998, which is one of the peak years of state terror and torture, exactly, Clinton sent more arms in that one year than in the entire Cold War combined, up to the onset of the counterinsurgency. Try to find a reference to this in the U.S. press. I mean, they had a very good correspondent, the New York Times in Ankara, mm -hmm. knew all about it, not a word. You know. The Kurdish, this is my question. Um, uh, I see the Kurdish issue. Turkish uh, government is one of the most racist governments. It was in the Constitution when I wrote a journal article on uh, uh, democracies uh, because Turkey had the habit of banning parties. The Constitution Court banned so many parties, therefore uh, the name of my article was Cannibal Democracies. <laughs> In the name of protecting democracy, you are keep banning the parties, political parties, a paradox. And um, the Kurdish population, the Kurdish language was banned in Turkey at that time. The Constitution article was not referring to the word Kurdish. They didn't want even to utter the word. Mountain Turks. Yeah. yeah. The banned language says, according to the criminal, and then Kurdish people could not sing in their own language. 
and give their names to kids, Kurdish names and Kurdish towns. That's incredible. Incredible. Well, I, this I, is I was there in the year 2000. Yeah. I actually went to, I asked to be a co-defendant in a fake trial under a military tribunal, but at the time I, I did go out to Diyarbakir and uh, with uh, Turkish intellectual activists, yeah. really good people. I read the news. Uh, but one thing that was quite interesting, which I never reported, is uh, when we were walking through the streets in Yarbakir, if the if the people with me, you know, the human rights activists, if they saw children playing whose clothes happened to have the mixture of clothes, you know, would be the Kurdish color, they directed us somewhere else because there were security people and. Uh, television crews and they told me later that if they found a collection of children whose clothes looked like the Kurdish color of the families would say, I mean it was just minor. I want yeah. to cut my questions short yeah. because you have another uh, appointment coming. Um, yeah, the Kurdish issue right now they are on hunger strike and um, uh, they are very arrogant, basically racist people really they become they, they are in denial. They don't see their racism. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Palestinian-Israeli issue, and uh, I know about your position. But uh, I personally don't think that two-state is possible, practical, after so much gerrymandering and uh, basically getting settlements every corner they wish. And Kamal Nawash, I don't know whether you heard of him, he's a attorney, a lawyer in uh, uh, Washington DC, American Palestinian, and together with some Jewish uh, friends, they established a kind of organization promoting uh, two state, one country solution and through a kind of federal <coughs> device to protect the Israelis' concern regarding population 50 50. Yeah. And by this way, having both of them, both uh, nations live. That's in peace. That's what I've been proposing for 70 years. Or you, you, for 70, you are at seven, for this one state. 70 years. Fantastic. Uh, and without a break, writing about it and so on. But I'm different from them. Okay. I want to achieve it, not talk about it. Okay. And to achieve it, you have to pay attention to the real world. And you have to ask, what can be done at this moment to move towards it? Well, pre-1948, when this was one of my main preoccupations, you could imagine moving towards it directly. 48, no. Uh, 1967, there was another possibility. At that time, Israel conquered the whole territory. You could have moved directly towards some kind of federalism of the kind you're describing. I wrote about it. Uh, uh, it was bitterly denounced across the board. Uh, nobody wanted to hear about it. By 1975, that became impossible because the Palestinian national issue reached the international agenda. But then you get the two state efforts, uh, uh, overwhelming international consensus. Uh, the United States has had to block it ever since 1976. Uh, let's go to today. What are the options? Uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of my friends are in this same group. They're living under a serious illusion they don't recognize that the two that the options are not two states or one state. The options are two states or the U.S. Israel do exactly what they're doing, and exactly what they're doing is separating Gaza from the West Bank, turning Gaza into a prison, uh, taking over whatever's of value in the West Bank, which is going to have very few Palestinians, so there won't be any apartheid uh, issue, there won't be any civil rights struggle, and they'll leave the rest of the Palestinians uh, at unviable cantons. Yeah. That's the alternative to two states. Yeah. What you just described is a nice idea, but it's not one of the alternatives. Yeah, I, I, we don't hear much about that. I hear a lot about it, way yeah. too much. No, in the in, 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 in media, in America. Actually, it's interesting, you hear much more about it now Once than they, when it was feasible. And from 67 to 75, you heard nothing except condemnation of anybody who started to raise it. Starting the last few years, the mainstream media are willing to tolerate 
So you get articles in the New York Times, the New York Review, and you don't like it. But Friedman, I think Friedman, he also, I think, wrote about that. I hate this. <laughs> and Ed Said had an article, yeah. and Tony Truth had an article, and there were others. And so the interesting question is why are they willing to accept it now when they weren't willing to accept it when it was feasible? And I think there's a reason. Now it is understood to be a way to support the U.S.-Israeli policies. If you call for pie in the sky, you know, you say, I'd like to have peace in the world. Now that's support for people who want to develop the weapon systems. Yeah, they say, sure, we'd like to have peace in the world too, but, you know, let's talk about the real world. So if you insist on extricating yourself from the real world, in fact, you're supporting the harshest, most problems. Now, in fact, this is still a good idea, and I still advocate it, but it has to be reached in stages. And the only proposal that there is, the only proposal, is to reach it through a two-state settlement. There is simply no other proposal. So if you don't like that proposal, you're saying oh, you want to denounce me yeah. suicide. Yeah. And so, yes, it's always been a nice idea, like peace on earth. Uh, but if you want to reach, if you want to reach it, not just talk about it. You have to say, how do we get from here to there? Now, in fact, one of the real, I've been involved with all kind of nationalist movements over the years. And one thing that's really harmed the Palestinians, uniquely in my experience, is their unwillingness to look at real world circumstances and ask how we can move forward. Exactly. Instead, what they said, we've got to stand on principle. And it's kind of striking because if you look at the Zionist movement, right next door. Now, the way they succeeded was keeping the principles in the back of their minds, but saying, okay, let's get this little piece, or this little piece, or this little piece. Palestinians, Pragmatic. Palestinians refuse to do that. It's one of the reasons they get crushed. Thank you. My last question is a little bit personal. It's up to you to answer or not. If there was God, which I argue there is God, in fact, I had debate with the uh, president of atheist organization in New Jersey and also with uh, Michael Shermer, Skeptic Society. But if there is a God, if you had a chance to ask a question and get an answer, and a prayer get an answer, what would be your question to know and your prayer? Well, this may not be the most polite comment, but uh, my basic feeling is like Thomas Paine. If there is a God, he's a devil. Oh, no. And if you look at the history of the world, I don't see what other... Uh, first of all, if, if it's the God of the Old Testament, he's a genocidal maniac. I mean, the Old Testament is the most genocidal book uh, in the entire literary canon. I mean, God is so such a genocidal fanatic that he was willing to destroy every living thing on earth some human being offended him. I mean, you can't. That's the Noah story. No, we have that. to have rain check for this debate. I, <laughs> I really, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, uh, I disagree with that. I yeah. think I have very good di uh, discussion for that. But hopefully, I don't know whether you are interested to discuss sure. this issue, problem of evil. Yeah. And what was your prayer? My prayer. Yeah, yeah. something yeah. that wanted too many things. Too many things. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested in improving things. Um, the, this human species now is on a precipice facing disaster uh, for two cases. The one is environmental catastrophe, which is coming, and the other is nuclear war, which gets worse and worse every year. And uh, I'm not interested in abstract considerations. I'd like to be able to deal with those. Otherwise, there's nothing else to talk about. That's right. Thank you very much, Noam. Yeah.